Once again, thank you all so much for joining us for this community call on learning from community preprint adoption in the social sciences. So as you know, preprints have become a major feature of biomedical research communication in recent years, but this phenomenon uh, really began in around 2013 when BioArchive uh, was founded. And of course, there were earlier experiments um, in the life science as well, dating back even to the 1960s. But uh, for many researchers, the preprint phenomenon is something that has occurred um, really only in the last few years. By contrast, other disciplines have had a much longer history with preprints. I think everyone is aware of Archive being founded in 1991. But SSRN, the Social Science Research Network, um, and REPIC, uh, the Exchange for Economic Working Papers, were both founded in the 90s, in 1994 and 1997, respectively. So what does it mean to come from disciplines where there's a longer history and a, a uh, kind of stronger existing culture of sharing documents ahead of journal publication? To help uh, discover this. I'm going to uh, welcome today two excellent speakers. We've got Grace Binion. She's Assistant Professor of Psychology from Furman University, and she's a Scientific Advisory Board Member of Sci Archive. And second, we've got Philip Cohen, a sociologist and demographer at the University of Maryland and founding director of Social Archive. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Grace for her talk. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with Sci Archive. Um, this is the dedicated preprint server for psychological research. So if you want to advance to the next slide, I figure it makes sense to sort of contextualize my experience um, and Sci Archive's uh, development and history. So this is the first dedicated preprint server for psychological research, and it's relatively new. It was initiated at the first meeting of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science in the summer of 2016. Uh, it did not officially launch until later that year. There was a little bit of a soft launch in August 2016, and then it officially launched in December. So this is only about seven years old still. Initially, it was funded entirely by the Center for Open Science, um, and the infrastructure is still supported by the Center for Open Science, so right now a lot of our funding primarily comes from membership organizations, so from libraries. Um, we rely heavily on the Center for Open Science for technological infrastructure, for storage, for feature development, but we pay for that service. And um, so we reach out to memberships, membership organizations, universities and libraries, we fundraise, and then we pay for that. Um, everything else aside from the technolo technological infrastructure is volunteer run. So I serve in a volunteer capacity and have since um, the start of my time with Sci Archive. Our chair is a volunteer. All of our moderators are also volunteers. So we rely heavily on just grassroots community efforts. So I served, this is sort of a timeline history of, of my roles in Sci Archive. I served in an unofficial role for the first few months. Summer of 2017, I took over as public relations chair. So I would attend meetings, do a lot of outreach. That position lasted for about two years. And then I transitioned primarily into social media work, uh, which was really, that's basically just Twitter. Uh, we did not have a big uh, Facebook presence ever that we tried a little bit. It just didn't ever take off. It was mostly Twitter. Um, and that position lasted two years. At that time, we were sort of formalizing what any roles in the organization looked like, uh, decided on two-year terms. And then I rolled off of that and into the scientific advisory board role since 2021. Um, and that's primarily where I just get to advise on any new features or any policy questions that emerge with new leadership. So a lot of what I've done specifically and a lot of what we as an organization have done have really been just trying to get people to see preprints as a viable part of their workflow. 
um, and to understand how it might fit in their own, um, in the sort of life cycle of their research projects. So I've used social media a lot, and I know Sci Archive has leaned heavily on social media. Early on, a lot of this was just testimonials talking about experiences with Sci Archive, how easy it was, or how quick it was, or some of the benefits that they saw. We also have seen a lot of people sharing links to their preprints on social media, and this is really where I think um, a lot of the visibility in the community has taken off. So people will circulate working papers really quickly um, or will circulate uh, links to preprints uh, what, after they've submitted them to a journal or a post print even. Uh, and that's, I think, given the platform a lot of visibility. This is also, our use of social media has also facilitated quick discourse about bugs. So early on when, because the, the server is so new, there have been a lot of things that have not worked quite right or things that people wish worked differently. And as social media liaison, a lot of what I did was field that. I'd go back to a Center for Open Science and be like, hey, it looks like downloads are broken or it looks like the DOIs are displaying incorrectly or somebody's having an issue with a paper, how can we fix this? And then I would tweet back at somebody who had tweeted to SciArchive, oh, it looks like we're going to get that fixed or thanks for letting us know. We use DMs a lot for that as well. So I was sort of uh, customer service a little bit. Uh, we also, throughout our use of social media, really heavily leaned on and intentionally tried to engage people who are really visible in psychology. So people whose names were really widely distributed, Sanjay Stravastava, Brian Nozick, Samim Vizier, people who had a lot of social capital and broad social networks to talk about their use of preprints. Um, and that sort of further gave SciArchive a broad umbrella. Then, of course, we asked people on the scientific advisory board, people who had positive experiences with SciArchive, to do grassroots departmental outreach, talk to your colleagues, talk at a brown bag meeting about how this has been beneficial for you. Uh, building on that, we would sometimes do um, workshops and talks at society meetings, uh, talk about you know, how do you, how do you actually use this? Uh, one thing that we found is that people were really afraid of just trying to figure something else out. And so the, the more that we could smooth that, the better. Um, and from those, we also have published tutorials and guides so that people can access these really easily. That's been in the form of blog posts, but also published papers. Uh, we've posted slides from the, the workshops at society meetings on SciArchive so that people can access them. Um, and then, of course, we've done a lot of library outreach, trying to increase visibility at the institutional level, because libraries are going to know how to talk to folks at my own university that I don't necessarily have social capital to talk with. So what we've seen, oh, yes, and then we saw an unexpected boom during the pandemic. Um, the, both there's a lot of discussion about the appropriateness of using preprints in psychology during the pandemic. I know medicine saw a big boom. Uh, in the sort of public visibility of preprints during the pandemic, but so did psychology. And then there was a lot of discussion about whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, what the pros and cons are. And so there was this unexpected um, conversation that happened around preprints that I think has advanced the visibility and uptake uh, within the community. So overall, we've seen a generally positive response. There's been growing use in psychology, but there's always consistent um, hesitance or skepticism about, is this going to be difficult for me? Is it going to work uh, in my workflow? And primarily what we've seen, I think I mentioned that social media has been really, really helpful uh, in sort of increasing uptake and within social media, we found a couple strategies to be helpful. So first, we just talk about how there's not really a risk of scooping. Um, one of the first things that people ask about is, well, what if somebody tries to steal my idea? What if I get scooped? And in psychology, we just don't see a ton of evidence for that. There's more uh, concern in some subdisciplines where experiments are quicker to run, but a lot of behavioral experiments just take so long uh, that there's limited risk of scooping particularly when people can post a paper, it's got that timestamped DOI, and anytime there's been concern about attribution, you can go right back to that. 
Uh, we also de-emphasize sort of the cost in terms of time and effort of using the platform. Like it's so easy. All you have to do is click upload on a Word document. Somebody else moderates it. There's very little communication from your end. Uh, and then we've, all, of course, had to on the back end build features that have made that true. So um, I'll talk a, in a little bit about some of the things that we've done to make that real. Then we emphasize how helpful this can be to the researchers, to people personally. Uh, so talking about how you can get a wider audience, you can get better recognition, you can actually build collaborations. Um, Actually, a couple of the scientific advisory board members posted a preprint, solicited feedback, and then actually ended up with a new co-author. And so we talk about things like that. Um, we can form collaborations this way and incentivize sort of why you would want to add this extra step to your workflow. And then sort of as a last ditch, talk about how great it is for the researchers to pull on the ethics of it. That one, people don't like to be preached at in, in our experience, that kind of bristles uh, if we lead with like, this is great for research. And so instead we sort of like, this is great for you and it's good for research, it tends to be a bit of a better sell. Uh, and then we also, in many ways, as often as possible, give those how-to guides, post them, distribute them, remind them that this is actually pretty easy. So sort of first step, it's not scary, you're okay. Second step, this is actually helpful. Third step, I promise it's super easy and this is how you do it. Uh, and so what we've seen is that there's been this rapid adoption. Uh, the last numbers that I personally pulled were from 2020. Uh, so we had about 14 monthly uploads at the end of 2016 in our first month. And then we had about 450 in the summer of 2020 on average. We saw download numbers that were much larger. So about 850 monthly downloads in 2016, the 335,000 or so in the summer of 2020. Uh, we saw and heard a lot from our community that people would read. So download um, and read preprints before they started using them themselves. So it was this sort of soft, oh, I've seen my friends distribute these links. So I've seen these papers. I'm just going to casually search and see if there's anything that I like or that I need. And then over time, people would start uploading. So increase in downloads came before an increase in posting or uploads. Like I mentioned, we use a lot of community feedback, even on Twitter, to build a feature roadmap. So one thing that people really asked for early on was commenting and annotation. And then we built, that was one of the first things that we really tried to make um, after the, the sort of nuts and bolts, we added commenting to, to preprints. So authors can comment, readers can comment. Uh, we just recently added view counts. View counts had been collected since about 2018, but we added them into the platform so you could see who was reading your paper, not just who was downloading it. People really liked that. And then in, I think it was the end of 2020, we had we added direct journal submission to American Psychological Association journals from Sci-Archive. So this like, it really isn't that much extra time in your workflow. Like it's so fun, it's really easy. Uh, we made that true so that people could really just with a couple clicks submit directly from Sci-Archive uh, to a journal. And so we've seen a lot of growth. A lot of it has been idiosyncratic to what our community is needed. Um, but social media has been one of the big things that we've really leveraged. We've seen a lot of success that way. Thank you so much, Grace. <laughs> That's super interesting. I really want to uh, dig in a little more to this tension between what's good for the individual researcher and what's good for the community too, because that's something that I think we talk a little bit about um, as well within life sciences. Um, but I'd like to invite everyone to hold their questions until we hear from Philip Cohen, who I will hand over to now. Hello, hello. Can you see, hear my slide and hear me? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, um, uh, Jessica, um, uh, for having me and um, Grace for, um, that's a good, um, that's a great presentation. So I'll, um, um, some stuff I will, um, I, since I knew you were going first, some things I um, have left off that are similar to our stories. Um, Social Archive was also founded in 2016 during the same heady months of um, uh, of 2016. Um, in our case, it was um, 
really right after SSRN, which Jessica mentioned, was um, um, sold to Elsevier, and there was sort of um, um, a, a little collective um, freak out about that um, in social sciences. So we um, we we were motivated to, uh, to to launch right away at that time. We're also using the Center for Open Science OSF preprints platform. Um, for the last couple of years, Social Archive has been part of the University of Maryland Libraries, meaning um, essentially um, I serve at the pleasure of the dean, um, and um, and they pay our our annual bill to the Center for Open Science, which is twelve thousand um, dollars minus whatever we raise, um, which so far is not much. Um, so, um, so that's where we are, sort of um, technologically and institutionally. Um, um, we have a similar um, set of motivations. In fact, I use this motivation slide um, from an ASAP Bio, um, <laughs> adapted from an ASAP Bio slide um, deck a, a while ago. But these are the things that our users are trying to do. Um, they want to basically have their work seen earlier, faster. Um, they want editors and collaborators to see it. They want to get more feedback sooner. They want higher visibility. They want to create a record of their work um, for their own purposes and also for their own careers and so on. Um, so it's a similar set of motivations that I think you see anywhere that people, any anywhere that people are using preprints um, with some differences in social sciences. Um, we have um, uh, in sociology, oh, so I should have mentioned, I did put it on the slide, I didn't mention, um, we were started by sociologists and librarians. Um, um, so our steering committee is still a mix of sociologists and librarians and a couple of people who are not exactly sociologists. Um, um, but Social Archive was always intended to be all of social sciences. Um, and, and our vision at the time that we started was not to create a disciplinary repository, a, a narrow disciplinary repository, but a, as broad a one as we could, sort of on the scale of archive and bioarchive in the sense of um, sort of math and physics, life science, social science. That's kind of what we were thinking. Um, Sci-Archive obviously threw a wrench in the works of that right away by um, in immediately being so um, successful um, uh, and, and demonstrating really actually, you know, the, the great strengths of having a disciplinary focus because of the community building stuff that Grace, um, that Grace talked about. And that's been a kind of a little bit of a challenge for us. Um, so you'll see that we are disproportionately sociology, but not, um, but not majority sociology in terms of our papers right now. Um, the, um, this is this chart is just to show you sort of the I think we're somewhere in the middle of the pack in um, in social sciences as far as time to publication. These are the the, the American Sociological Association journals, which are um, um, you know a little bit more transparent than average. So they actually produce this this um, you know time time um, uh, uh, data. So you can see it's it's you know it's about a year. Um, th these these numbers are months from submission to publication, but in, but assume no time in revision. So it takes as long as it's so add add your revision time to this, and that's how long it takes. And it's just a long time to wait in today's day and age for your work to come out. Um, uh, we also have this issue of um, uh, uh, market domination. Um, this is the sociology. These five um, publishers are two thirds of sociology papers. Um, Sage in particular, and this is a real problem for us, um, publishes all of the American Sociological Association journals. And so ASA and SAGE together are um, honestly really a problem. Um, so, um, and, and that's been an issue for us with, um, with our institutional, um, our, our place in the institutional landscape um, as well as the cultural landscape. So that's an interesting issue for us. I'm interested to talk about that more. Um, so just to give you a, um, a quick look at what a, what a, what a preprint on Social Archive looks like, um, uh, it's quite similar to what you would see on Sci Archive. Um, uh, we have a view and download count. We have hypothesis annotation option um, for commenting on papers. We have the plotted endorsement button. If you want to endorse papers, um, we have the option to put su um, supplemental materials on the OSF platform and link them from your paper. Um, we give a preprint DOI, but then we also have a space for a publication um, DOI for authors that publish their work somewhere else. Um, a variety of licenses available. Um, a, a, a taxonomy um, uh, tags op options, and then um, versioning and version, um, uh, all the versions are preserved. Um, as far as the issue of who are we serving the community or the, uh, the authors, um, one thing that happens here is we don't take down old papers. Um, so if you put a new version, you know, you can put a new version, your old version is still there. If you decide you don't like it, you can't take it down. 
Um, so, um, so we're a little different from like SSRN is more of a uh, has more to, uh, of the position that the customer is the author. For us, that's really not the case. So there's been some education, um, some need for education on that uh, on that front. Um, our traffic. This is papers per day. Um, uh, and um, so we, for the last three years or so, we've been sort of between five and seven papers per day. Um, so we're up to about 13,000 papers now. Um, and if not, you know, this is not the exponential growth we would like to see. So we're, we're, we're growing linearly here, um, uh, uh, and which is great. And we're extremely useful to very many researchers and, and hosting a lot of papers, but um, have not had an explosion of, um, of uptake that we'd really like to see. Um, uh, our 13,000 papers are um, uh, self-tagged by authors, um, and you can see um, sociology is the dominant, um, but it's uh, but it's less than a third of the papers. Um, uh, and then we're very broad disciplinarily, um, economics, political science, education, all the way um, 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 down to environmental studies and geography, where there are substantial niches of people who are using um, the service in quite different disciplines. And so um, th there's a little bit of a trick for us is um, moderating this inflow of papers across um, different disciplines with different norms about what's acceptable and so on. And I can talk a little bit more about that um, as we go. Even within sociology, so those 4,000 papers or so, um, uh, we took the um, we took the step of breaking apart um, the the um, I guess it was the B press taxonomy that we inherited from Center for Open Science. And in sociology, we instead use this taxonomy of the sections of the American Sociological Association, um, which is um, good for sociologists because they recognize themselves. American sociologists um, know which sections they belong to. Um, and so uh, so that's been useful. Um, but again, it shows you really the, the, the breadth of the people who are using this, which is a strength and a weakness. I and mean, it's great that everybody... Um, that people in any area feel like they can use it and feel welcome. On the other hand, we don't have a strong um, concentration, which could help with some with some things. Um, our, uh, one development that um, I think is really good for us, um, I mean, Grace mentioned that we have technological issues because the platform is so new, but I, I'd be a little harsher than that. We have technological issues because Center for Open Science is underfunded. It's not Elsevier. Um, so they can't just throw millions of dollars at things. Um, uh, and we don't have um, all the money in the world. Um, so one of the things that um, this, the OSF platform is great as is as a backend tool, a backend type, I don't know if that's the right term, but as a platform that other people can build things on. Um, so one of the things that we have been had some success doing is getting people to, um, to um, use us as a host for their working paper series. And this, is, this goes to the long history of working paper series in social science, which really goes back to the 1930s with um, the National Bureau of Economic Research working papers and um, uh, and things that were distributed through libraries and through the mail. Um, but but the working paper series is a is a venerated tradition in, in many social science disciplines. And here's an example of one from the Stone Center um, at CUNY. Um, so essentially their affiliates and scholars can post papers in their series. They submit the paper to the Stone Center um, staff who vet it, make sure that they're an affiliated scholar, and then they upload it to Social Archive. Um, and so essentially what we've done is we've deputized their staff as moderators on Social Archive. So they bypass our moderation and approve their own papers and post them right away. Um, we've just used this model to launch a new working paper series by the Association for Popu of Population Centers, which is the demographers around the U.S. Um, and I think this is a good, this, this is both a community building and outreach strategy and also helps with um, the issue of um, credibility credibility and legitimacy. Um, if you know they get a title page, they get a working paper series number, they get approved by an institution that everybody respects in their discipline, um, and they're not just sort of throwing their work out there on social archive um, on their own. So I'm hopeful that this is actually going to be um, a good strategy for us going forward with more um, with more groups. Uh, Okay, common concerns, um, and I'm curious how much, uh, how, how well these resonate with people in different disciplines, but it's not good enough, so I'm afraid to share my early work, um, and we would, uh, you know, our counter argument, I have the counter argument for each of these. The counter argument is, you're, you know, you're submitting it to a journal, so I hope it's good. I hope you think it's good, <laughs> um, and you should, you should feel okay about it, at least, at least, um, at least that much. 
Um, I won't be able to publish it later. This is more urban legend than reality. Um, uh, we don't see this happen very much at all. There are occasionally journals, nowadays mostly minor journals in social sciences, who ask authors to take down their preprints or something like that, which again, we do not do. Um, um, so, um, uh, uh, but but that's really mostly mostly myth. Um, and then the scooping idea that Grace mentioned also um, is a, is something that people are afraid of um, and really mostly should not be afraid of. The, the preprint is more a way to protect you than it is to putting you at risk. And especially, and I make this point, especially for our junior scholars, um, the people you're most, at least in sociology, it's maybe different where you have to do experiments. In sociology, um, you may have a good idea and you may be at risk of somebody stealing that good idea. And that person is probably on your dissertation committee or in your department or something like that. Um, and probably not some random member of the public. Um, um, and and so what you actually don't want is a situation where, um, you know, 10 people who really care about your work know all about it before you have anything time stamped. Um, so so post your preference. That's been our argument. OK. Um, Unlike um, a, a comparison with like bioarchive and MedArchive, we post papers at all stages. Um, so it's before submission, um, when you submit it to a conference, after you submit it to a conference, um, uh, after you submit it to a journal, after it's accepted to a journal, after it's published in a journal, um, any stage at all. We're quite agnostic to that and we don't want to, essentially, we made the decision early on that we don't want to let journals define what is a legitimate publication or stage of publication and version of record is a marketing myth. Don't use that term. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so that's, so, so those are, that's when we, that's how we share them. The issues that we're facing now, um, it's one of the really, one of the great successes of SciArchive, I think, is that they have a society behind it. Um, we have always had a society against us, which is the American Sociological Association, more or less. That is, that we're a threat to their publication model. Um, they should have put up a preprint server in the first place. They objected to it. They kind of, Sage sort of did. It didn't really take off. I mean, it didn't take off at all, but it still probably still sort of exists. Um, so we've had a we've had some trouble um, with our societies um, in sociology and some other societies that are quite quite dug into their business model and not really interested in a preprint uh, model of distributing paper papers. Um, we have the issue of um, how to do this community building. Social media is free. It just takes time. Um, I'm, I, uh, we, don't, we also have no paid staff. Um, we, are, we don't have any unpaid staff. We don't have any staff. <laughs> um, uh, we, um, so, um, uh, where, what, what's the, the challenges for us are where do we get institutional support and how we sort of build ourselves into the workflow of our disciplines. Um, for our moderators, we have interesting, complicated issues about what is acceptable. Um, we have a very broad, um, we try to tell people and, you know, I don't want to, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't want to make us look bad, but there's a lot of junk on social archive and we're not here to police the quality of your work. Um, um, so um, having a paper on social archive is not really an accomplishment. <laughs> it's great that you did it and you should do it, um, but it, it is going to be on the shelf next to just some other stuff that people submitted. Um, but we don't want to take anything. Um, and so we do, we do, you know, have issues with undergraduate papers, bad undergraduate papers, but then there are great undergraduate papers. We have things written by machines that we try to weed out. We have things that are scams that come in where people try to create fake identities and make them co-authors with famous people. That's one thing that people have tried to do. Um, so there's a variety of things we're, we're hoping, you know, that we're struggling with all the time. Um, um, uh, OSF, uh, the COS is going to bring us ORCID, um, ver uh, verified ORCID IDs soon, supposedly. That would be great. We'd like to require verified ORCID IDs for our authors. We don't currently. Um, we also accept things in any language Google can translate. Um, so that's really fun and interesting. And some of our really popular papers are in languages that our moderators don't speak. Um, but that is, of course, you know, a little bit of a challenge. Um, but uh, but we don't limit based on language. OK, um, uh, uh, I'm not going to get into the detail on this because I'm out of time, but there's a lot of questions about sustainability. And how do we do this for free? Um, the economists have all the money in the world, so that doesn't matter. They just they just have money. Um, the Repic um, is a is a is an awesome archive which basically runs on a shoestring, um, and um, is you know is a is 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 you know is not a big retail operation in terms of staff and so on. SSRN was sold to Elsevier, so that's one approach. Um, and then there's us, which we basically are 
our financial need is $12,000 a year at the moment. We need moderators. We need somebody to kind of be in charge. Um, but um, that doesn't give us marketing development. Um, that doesn't give us, you know, some of the stuff we'd like to have. So that, that is a challenge for us um, uh, in the future is how do we um, both keep that going forever, but also come up with money to grow and improve and so on. So that's uh, that's a challenge. Okay. So I'd love to hear your questions and comments. And again, thanks to Jessica and Grace.